Hey, Peter, thanks for joining me today, brother. I appreciate you being here. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I've been very excited to, uh, to talk to you today. Yeah, 100%. Um, so you are the founder of iEmotions. You uh, self-described a gladiator entrepreneur. Um, I'd love to learn a little bit about your journey, uh, what brought you to, to creating the company iMotions. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that has been a, a long journey. Um, mm -hmm. so, so basically, uh, it's, it's a quite long story, but we have an hour. <laughs> sure. So, uh, but I, I probably have to put uh, bits and pieces together. But, but the main drive has been uh, to, to try to build a platform that can help uh, diagnose neurological diseases, uh, mm -hmm. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ADHD, mm -hmm. autism in kids anxiety and so on. <clears throat> and uh, one of the key uh, factors of doing that is to understand human behavior. And I know you have an interest in VR and, and you know how that could uh, potentially also be used in this space. So we build a, a platform uh, for research. So we, we, we sell our software platform to professors all over the world that, uh, that do research in, in these kind of uh, diseases, for example. So we uh, combine a lot of different biosensors together I'm sure you heard about eye tracking before, you know, mm -hmm. we track the eye all the way up to thousands of times per second. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, bling pupil and a lot of other data you can get out of that. And uh, then we work with facial expressions, uh, heart rate, also EEG, if you know what that is, you know, where you dig mm -hmm. deeper into the brain. Mm -hmm. um, so we try to take all of these sensors and bring them into one software platform to make it easy for professors and, and, and researchers out there uh, to, to learn new things about human behavior and how human reacts. Um, so, but, but the drive of why I started it was, um, was basically my mother, she uh, had a severe uh, Parkinson's disease um, and unfortunately she passed away uh, very quickly from it. Uh, it's, it's an accelerating Parkinson plus it's called. Um, and you know, there was no way we could at all like figure out what was wrong with her. Um, we just saw she began to fall and, and get dizzy and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, before we even had a chance to um, do anything, she was in a wheelchair. And unfortunately, uh, after a few years, she, she passed away already from a very quick deterioration. So, you know, as a family, it's very tough to go through. I'm, I'm sure you have talked to other people who have been through something like that, you know, as, as, as children. And we try to do it. You throw everything you have <clears throat> to try to understand what's wrong. And, you you know, and suddenly, you know, you stand there and, and, and your beloved mother has passed away. Yeah. So what I thought is like, OK, we have been working on eye tracking for a lot of years. And I think that's one of the senses, you know, you can read a lot through the pupil, for example, you know, pupil dilations and blinks. And, and you know, it's it's one of the fastest muscles in our in our body, actually. But we could also see that was not the full answer. And that's why there was no platform like this. We'd say, OK, we have to try to see if we can get all these uh, biometric signals together in order to diagnose a disease like this much earlier so we can help the treatment a lot quicker and then you know hopefully in the end of the day uh, that can help to to uh, cure some of these diseases so that was a pretty uh, uh, crazy ride where you throw everything and you just you know like 15 years later you know uh, 90 hour weeks and and traveled across the globe 40 states of the u.s just trying to to meet professors and, and see how we can help them to push this kind of research forward um, so that's the that's the wow. short story. Um, that's that's a lot more to it, and so many people who have been part of it. Like you know, it's all about the team, and and you know, I mean, it's it's they have basically built the company, but of course, you need somewhere to start. And I think you know, that's that's probably what I what I was wow. part of too. Wow, that's a, that's a powerful origin story, and on on what brought you into the space, and yeah, I mean, there's looking at the biosensors and the feedbacks. I mean, there are so many underlining. Um, pieces of us that aren't communicated through our words, right? As as you know, there's so many so many factors that we're very good, and we've 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 had millions of years to evolve the ability to, you know, look at another human or you know ancestors and be able to understand. Okay, well, I f is this person being truthful? Are they not being truthful? Are they worried? Are they saying one thing but doing another? And we intuitively understand those things, but trying to trying to demystify the intuition of the mm -hmm. of the in underlinings of the human condition is 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 no small undertaking and I, i'd be very curious to hear because that's trying to describe something that is very natural 
to say, oh, biometrically, this is how this is actually being affected underneath, like whether you're using a galvanized skin response or EKG or HRV or any of those other types of devices, yeah. it's very hard to do that. What, what have been some of your threshold guardians that you've had, things that you've had to come up and do battle against to try to get all this technology to actually work? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a very interesting question. So when we started out, like 15 years ago, the first time, only with eye tracking, you know, it's it's like this back in the day with with the PCs, you know, like with the, um, uh, when Microsoft came into the picture, it was all hardware, right? It was IBM, Hewlett Packard, and so on that built hardware devices that was extremely expensive, but you couldn't really use them for anything. And that's the same trend we have seen in the biometric space or the biosensor space. So. For example, an eye tracker just when we started out was like $35,000 just to get this huge piece of, of device uh, that was extremely intrusive, right? And you even started by having a head chin rest, you know, with, with for these very, so, so I mean, it yeah. was so unnatural, right? So one of the things that we have um, fought against, you can say, is the evolution of the hardware, right? Because we needed to uh, make it smaller and, and less expensive so we could make it available for the larger crowd. And, and so, so that has been a, a, a large journey where we have tried to build an ecosystem of all these hardware providers so that we can also help the researchers to figure out what to buy. And they often have very limited budgets, right? So that has been a very uh, tough challenge to try to make sure that we, we could like push the hardware industry forward uh, so that it, this gets more affordable and more uh, you know, possible to do um, without having to spend $100,000 before you even have started any research. So that was one uh, obstacle that we have uh, tried to to work with, you know, like kind of getting the hardware uh, cost down. <clears throat> and then, of course, there's the data quality, uh, like, you know, because what happens in, and, and we all know that if you put bad stuff in, you get even worse stuff out, right? So I think having to build a standard platform that kind of take all of these devices with, with kind of a middleware, so you still have access to all the raw data as a, you know, as a researcher, but still basically make it all synchronized uh, is super difficult and, and it sounds pretty simple. Uh, but for example, if you have an eye tracker that's 300 hertz, that means 300 samples per second. A GSR device is 8 hertz, you know, and you have all these different devices that have different frame rates. That's one thing to coordinate that. But then also you have to coordinate a lot of video streams. Like we're sitting here in real time seeing each other over Zoom now. We know how much they have worked on getting no uh, delay, for example, right? For many, many years with Skype, Zoom, all these guys now making it this real experience. Like I feel I sit here with you. That's the same for us because we combine the research with what people are seeing, you know, an image or video. I could test myself now on, on what I'm seeing you here on the screen, right? So that all those video streams are also super difficult to, uh, to synchronize. And then on top of that, together with the biosensors and then actually have it showing live which is really amazing. So today you can actually sit with our platform and, and I could have, you know, all the signals here. We should have done that. Maybe we can, we can make a follow-up session. That would be <laughs> we can, we can get cool. some people tested on our show and see how they react. Uh, that would be fun. Um, but basically being able to show all of those things live mm -hmm. is really quite amazing. So as a researcher today, when you do a research, you can sit and see exactly what happens, you know, while, while, yeah. uh, while the interaction is happening, which is really a huge step forward. So that's a few of the challenges like technologically that we have solved in, in iMotions that nobody has done uh, anywhere else in the world today. Yeah, it's one of those things when someone says, oh, just just make it all work. Just put it all together, make it work. You're like, okay. And you're like, fast forward 16 years later. You're like, yeah. <laughs> you're like, exactly. it, takes, it takes time and effort. I mean, yeah. I often say that um, entertainment has sold us a fantasy that now technology is trying to live up to. Yeah. Right. And so sure. you're looking at a situation where you've created in order to really have us merge with the machine or whatever you want to call it to have a better type of connection that we've created, you know, we've created words and languages and emotions and all those things as a way to connect with one to another. And I truly believe that the, the greatest technologies are the ones that allow us to, to have a deeper understanding of the other and of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't even understand. We think that the challenges we think sometimes that we know a person when mm -hmm. actually we are often more times wrong than we than we think we are. Right. So we have this overcompensation this 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 bias to being right but it's not yeah. always true but with the data and the science you mm -hmm. can actually dive into the facts and find out that some that 
that there is a misalignment. Can you talk to me about a situation or any of the technologies that, that you use that is exciting to kind of create a better connection or understanding of the individual? Is there any like stacking of the tech or things that stand out to you as, a, as an example that you could share? I think the one that's most easy to relate to, of course, is eye tracking, but also facial expressions, right? So mm-hmm. we all, as the, the human being is a facial expression detection machine. I always say that, you know, like, because we don't think about it, but let's, let's, let's uh, position ourselves. We are walking down the, in the shopping mall or on the street and we see thousand people, right? But very, from very far away, we can imagine right away recognize people, right? I mean, from a very far distance, right? And that's also a specific way that we all interpret uh, the, the face. We look at the eyes first, you know, and then uh, mouth. And, and, you know, like it's very clear how the signals are. Um, and I think that in itself is really interesting. And, and so when, you know, we always say, hey, we have to uh, believe our gut feeling, right? And that often happens from that instant reaction. And then you we begin to cognitively process all the data. And then sometimes that's where we, process ourselves cognitively out of the real of uh, away from the gut feeling right and then we always come back and say you know my gut feeling was this and then we, we learn to trust our gut feeling right but i think facial expressions is 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 really exciting it's also partly scary uh because obviously you give a lot of signs to the large corporations you know the googles all of these guys by being interpreted and and uh, but but i think there's two sides of it one is that we look at um, facial expressions for um, measuring behavior, and we try to use it in a good way. And then there's the other side of it where it's more as uh, used for identity, right? Uh, where it's, hey, how do I identify this person and, and, and maybe exploit them or use their data or whatever, right? So I think as a behavioral tool, I think it's super interesting. And, and as you know, CIA and all these guys, they get trained to look at, there are a few muscles we cannot control ourselves. And, and, you know, like it's, it's, it's not that difficult to learn to, uh, to really look at these uh, cues on, uh, on human beings. Um, so, yeah, so I think. How would you, okay, so uh, I, I want to touch on that. But before that, I just, just curious about the CIA question, train muscles on the phrase. Could you say just a little bit more about that? Just because out of pure curiosity. Uh, yeah, so, you know, you have these, uh, back, I mean, back in the day, today you begin to use technologies like this where you can actually take a technology like ours and live observe all the different facial cues, you know, which is is pretty wild. So, I mean, you can have that live showing on you now when I talk to you, right? But back in the day, you know, when, when, when uh, you had to be a trained uh, interrogator, you know, you, you, you learned about these muscles where you, for example, when, when you do not tell the truth, there's specific cues Mm -hmm. that that could be the eyebrow that goes up here, for example, some of the stuff that you cannot really control yourself, but obviously you can, uh, teach yourself a lot as a human being, right? So that's why it can never stand alone, uh, you know, and, and that's why, you know, that you still need technologies or lie detection tests and so on uh, to, to, to kind of, but you can still get an indication in an early interview, right? When you sit with, with uh, a suspect and then look at them and, and you can see some of these cues, it's like, okay, let's make, a, let's make a real test or let's dig deeper into this, right? Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you get a baseline to kind of see how they perform, and then you use the baseline and cross-reference it with what's going on in the situation, looking at those the telltells that, that either they gave away or kind of a standard telltale yeah. sign. Yeah. Okay. But I do think that one of the main things of what we do is that we, we are what we call ourselves, like, or we call ourselves like multimodal, right? So facial expression is one modality. It's like one kind of signals, and then there's a lot of signals within that. Eye tracking is another one. But the whole existence of eye motions is based on that we believe that you need more modalities to understand human behavior. None of these can stand alone. Mm-hmm. So if you're an eye tracking company, face expression company, GSR company, all these different companies, they only have a little piece of the answer. Um, and I think that's that's really what's what's exciting about what we do, that we don't only use facial expressions or only use eye tracking. We kind of combine all of this uh, for the researchers to be able to leap forward and better understand human behavior. So... On that note, looking at that, do you do you run them through like an AI algorithm to look for telltale signs or the things that you do when you get there? Because you're getting a lot of raw data running through there. You always need uh, you know labeling, man of the machine, all that fun stuff. Yeah. Do you do you do you run AI through? That's a, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, so so the simple answer and the fast answer for us is no, uh, we don't. Uh, and it's funny because I just had a meeting with Gartner today. One of the newer mm-hmm. industries or categories is emotion AI. I'm sure you've heard about that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's in some ways a pop word or whatever, but, but 
emotion AI um, is derived from something that is underneath, you know, like, so I see us as a provider of, of high quality data in order to be able to do the AI on top. And that is kind of what have been our core until now is to make sure that we have transparent data. People have also always access down to the raw data, even from the hardware device. So all of these things are very important for us. And that's kind of the first, you can say, focus we have had. And then the next steps is, of course, that, that you begin to put AI on top of uh, some of the results. But in general, that is what our clients do as well, right? So mm -hmm. if they want to build, for example, uh, in VR, uh, mm -hmm. some emotion AI technologies that gives live feedback to the VR environment. So the v VR environment changes depending on the emotion response. Mm -hmm. But that is, uh, that's why I said the short answer is no. So we don't build our own metrics. We, we actually just try to push this ahead a little bit um, to try to democratize this, this, this area so that you can always have high quality data from, uh, from doing this kind of research. Mm -hmm. And then we know that there's a, a baseline or you know, a, a fundamental truth, so to say, that people can build on. And that's what you get out of using iMotion's platform underneath for this kind of research. Um, so but, hmm? No, I was gonna say so much of the uh, AI is, is all about the data and labeling. That's like yeah. the, the thing. So it sounds like to me that you provide a lot of the data and you're like, hey, if you're an academic, wherever you're at, great. Here's the raw data. Here's the output that we have. You can take that and funnel it through your own AI system and exactly. go with it. But you're, you're providing the source of it, which is the, the, the lifeblood of all AI. So yeah. that, and, and, and I think to add, so then we also have an API, which is really interesting. So let's take an example of, of a car corporation. Like we, we have clients in all categories, right? But let's say a driving simulator. So we, it's also very easy to combine uh, the biosensors with people's own systems. So let's say if you're in a car, a speeder, throttle, you know, um, you know, steering wheel, all of that, you can also live observe together with all the biosensors. So when you do these AIs, you have a lot of data that you already have, you know, used in your metrics or algorithms, but then you mm -hmm. suddenly get this biometrics on top in order to strengthen the algorithms, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So, so a lot of our corporate clients, they're using and, and building their own AI on top, but, mm -hmm. but, but we want to kind of stay objective. So all that we publish in the platform, all the metrics, they have been scientifically uh, validated and they have been published uh, in peer reviewed journals, or else we don't put them into our platform. So you can imagine that we have this library of already proven stuff uh, that then becomes accessible for even like a young, well, soon it's gonna be in high school that you can even do this with the prices that, that they're coming down. But let's say in, as an undergraduate student working in a lab at, um, uh, you know, um, University of San Francisco or wherever, I mean, then you come in and you can actually take something that people have used 20 plus years to validate and use it directly by the click of a button on your own data, right? I mean, that's, I think is very powerful and gonna speed things ahead, you know, in the, in the research space. In every technology, in every industry, you, you always look back at the people or the people from the past look back at the people now and go, you don't know how easy you have it. Like for me in the world of virtual reality, you know, I've been in for a number of years, back in the day, it took so much, just look at 360 cameras, stitching those things together was incredibly difficult, right? It was a whole process. Now you have a one button automation, stitches mm -hmm. the whole thing together. It makes yeah. life incredibly beautiful. So, I mean, mm -hmm. that's the thing we're constantly building um, frameworks on top of other existing models and saying, look, we're gonna make this easier, faster and better. Cause I really truly believe mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur or anybody, uh, value is created when you make something that is collectively it's very difficult to have access to and you package it up and and you go this is something that was only available to a group of uh highly paid specialists and now yeah. i'm gonna make this available to mass that that mm -hmm. inflection point is where actual value is created and yeah. it sounds like that's what you've made it you made it very easy instead of it being yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars for the systems one mm -hmm. click of the button streams out the data Exactly. And then, of course, we do have a lot of metrics and, and building on that layer with time, right? But but we still try to make sure that it's something that's published. And, you know, like, I mean, that's a whole other discussion that's, you know, maybe people see this year from now, but this has been a crazy year, 2020, right? Because, yeah. you know, we have grown uh, every year uh, for many years, like very high growth, this company. And, um, and then suddenly all our clients couldn't get into the lab, right? So, I mean, all the universities closed down, all the laboratories in, you know, all the, the Expedia, Procter & Gamble, Unilever, I mean, nobody could get into the lab. So we were kind of challenged. Um, so we have, 
really been innovating a lot this year. Uh, and, and that that's, I think, you know, from where we are today with the labs, we then have an extension for online data collection. So you can see here, you have the world in your background here, right? So if you imagine you can sit and set up a study, then we can through the webcam, uh, both do face expression and eye tracking. Of course, you don't get the same quality eye tracking, but still today you cannot do any research. And I think that's also gonna um, help the universities a lot because then they can still do the research while they're sitting at home. So that has been an extension uh, we have done, which is super exciting. And, and I don't think the market was ready for that. The last 15 years thinking, when should we go with having an online extension to this? And now I think, you know, people were forced into it and that has just leaped the, the area ahead. And I think that's gonna stay, that people are still gonna do some kind of online research. But I also believe that lab is always gonna be there. You know, that's always gonna be the super high-end laboratories in the universities and the companies. And then the, the next evolution that we're working on is cool. Uh, just to mention that that is um, uh, mobile. So basically from your mobile, uh, you will have like much more light sensors. You know, we all have like a Fitbit and this kind of stuff. But if you imagine that you have patches for heart rate and, you know, accelerometers that you walk around with for more longer term uh, observations. So you, it would not be like, you know, minutes, hours or even days, but it would be like weeks and months of observation. For example, on Parkinson patients, some like that, if they fall in the home together with heart rate and you can then trigger, for example, a survey and say, hey, you just went into the kitchen, do you need help or something like that? So that, that's the extension uh, of, of the evolution of our product. And it's, it's just super exciting, but it's all research based, right? It's something that's gonna leverage research for, yeah, for the world. Well, it's a couple of things on that. One being, yeah, I mean, 2020, forced everyone to go online you know it, it, virtual reality and other online mediums went from being a vitamin to a pain pill overnight where you just now have to you got to figure it out mm -hmm. uh, to where some of my team members are like even though like let's get in person like well why get in person it's, it, it wastes so much time we have to drive we have to meet and you can see that there's this there's this cognitive shift in the area of, of it just being forced to a new way of living but then adjusting to and acclimating and yeah. So that's why it sounds like you're, you're introducing online and you're introducing mm -hmm. mobile, basically all the forms that would allow you to continue um, all the biometric data gathering, but just at a safe social distance. Yeah, exactly. But you would still have um, lower data quality, right? From the eye tracking, I mean, from a webcam, that's a reason for why you pay still $10,000 for one of the high-end eye trackers. Uh, but it's just the flexibility for now, but then also you're gonna, you can execute the studies much quicker, right? You can say, hey, you would like to test on somebody in China, you can set it up, click a button, and then you can have 500 Chinese uh, respondents within a few hours, right? Yeah. So, so there's something about the speed of, of doing the research, but I always believe that lab and, you know, like this, you know, higher end census is gonna be, you know, there and it's gonna be super important for the world always. Um, there's, there's always changing. There's always a, a, a market uh, for higher end quality. I mean, you could take a look at that even even the world of VR. I mean, there's there's expensive rig systems that are much more immersive uh, yeah. versus the lower end. It's just you know it's it's breadth versus depth, and yeah. that's that's how it's always. There's always going to be a market for both sides of it. Yeah. Um, with with that, with looking at the the sensors, you're talking about eye tracking things like that. I'd love to talk a little bit about virtual reality. So do you do you leverage the eye trackers that are in some of the VR headsets already? Or, yes. you know, how did, yeah, you do? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, love to hear a little bit about uh, the virtual reality space. My guess yeah. is you, sounds like you have a Unity plugin, you do some things like that. Uh, love to hear a little bit more about it. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's, uh, it's, it's super exciting. And I still think this is, of course, still early on uh, in the VR space, but but we, uh, we have uh, both the Tobii I integrated, which is the first device we did. Actually, the, the, like the rebuilt one that they did manually. We started mm -hmm. as the first company to, to integrate that for eye tracking. Um, and then um, we are working with a company called Vagio, if you know those guys. Vagio? Um, Vagio, yeah. Vagio. V-A-R-J-O. Uh, I think so, yes. Yeah, I've heard Finish of them. Project. I've heard of them, yes. I mean, that that is definitely the most high-quality device out there. Uh, but it's also, it's not consumer-grade, right? I mean, it's it's something you still pay, you know, like three to $5,000 for. But as a research tool, it's absolutely amazing. It's like sitting here in real world, right? Um, and that has also extremely precise eye tracking. And, uh, and, and what's happening very soon, there's a few companies working on that. But actually, you 
uh, you will soon be able to measure at least some of the facial cues from inside the VR headset. For example, the brow furrow and some of that stuff that happens. Uh, now you raised your brows really quickly there. Mm. I mean, this kind of stuff you'll be able to measure inside uh, the, the, the VR headset, right? But also, for example, uh, adding in GSR, you know, your heart rate. I mean, for example, if you look at... Um, Anxiety. I think this is going to be amazing for, for, for VR. And we have a, a very exciting project right now called VR8, where we work with different uh, research institutions and universities on, on, on having, you know, that you can build your environment in Unity. As you say, we have Unity mm -hmm. plugin, right? Um, we can also use a lot of other engines. But so if you imagine you have arachnophobia, as an example, then, you know, you have the, the spider coming nearer you and then you could sit live uh, as the, the therapist, right? And see, oh, now the, you know, both the heart rate goes up and the, and the you know, the arousal. Now they might get overexposed. We have to pull the spider back, for example. So you can make all of these, it's called a closed loop system. I'm sure you're you are aware of that term. Mm -hmm. So these closed loop systems can change the, the unity environment based on the emotional response that is elicited on the, on the, on the respondent. And I see a huge future on that. Uh, and, you know, within long, well, I mean, that's maybe more five, 10 years out, but there is a lot of people who have these headsets at home, or it's going to be part of your, your, your medical treatment when you go to, um, uh, you know, San Francisco, what is it called? University of San Francisco Medical Center, for mm. example. Um, then you get one of these home and they ship it home to you. And, and then you begin the therapy, both for post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome and, and you know, different kind of anxieties. And, and, and I mean, that is just really, really exciting to be part of, I think. And, and I think you, you need to have the biosensors there because those the, you cannot test if the treatment doesn't like if it works, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you get anxiety, all your vices go up. That's very clear, right? But what is really exciting, you can see then if you keep, working with the with the, the sick person right then you can see that they, they get less and less uh, anxiety and, and and higher heart rate and and, and all that uh, over time so you can actually see that the treatment works right that's super powerful yeah I mean in the in the clinical med medical space I mean there's there's three forms of me measurements there's the self-reported there's the, mm -hmm. the observer reported and then there's the the data the yeah. unbiased data that you receive and all of them are, are critical because then you can kind of create that trifecta of, okay. And I've noticed that uh, the self-reports self are usually wildly, <laughs> yeah. they kind of, they, they wildly vary all over the place versus you can get some, some pretty solid data points. And yeah. I know you're, you're talking earlier about, because um, uh, yeah, a friend of mine who I've worked on a couple of projects with, Skip Rizzo, yeah, has, cool. things, has done uh, uh, things like Brave Mind and other types of psychological experiences where they put the user in it and had them go through it. Um, yeah. And you mentioned him earlier, um, I'm familiar with Skip Rizzo as well. Uh, I'd, I'd love to talk uh, a bit more about um, this psychology in VR, understanding mm -hmm. the user behavior, where you see things are going, the closed loop system. Um, and, you know, ultimately, because it, it's going, it's always going to go from the clinicians or those places to eventually to the consumer has control of their own yeah. biofeedback system. So I'd love to have you expand a little bit more upon that. Yeah, I think, you know, I think, you know, of course, it's going to be an evolution, right? And, and, you know, like, I'm maybe one of the guys that's a bit more skeptical with regards to if we're all going to have, a, you know, a VR headset in our home. Um, you know, I, I definitely think, you know, we also work with a lot of the cool people over at MIT and so on that has built some really exciting stuff. That's a side story, but I'll come back to that uh, for VR. But I think, you know, as a consumer uh, headset, uh, you know, that's going to take time for sure. Also, it takes a lot, lot of time before the price comes fine off down. But I do think the first step is when you go to, um, to a medical doctor, right, and, and you have these kind of signs, um, and you can be using it for, uh, first of all, diagnosing this, right, as part of the diagnosis. And you say there's a self-report part of it that you can actually build into the virtual reality experience, right? So you can have the gloves on and you can go in there and then the therapist can ask questions that you can answer in there. So you can actually also um, trigger some of the, 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 uh, the self-reporting questions inside the VR environment. So it's more natural, for example, right? To remove that, that you either have to, you know, answer a survey after the whole experience, right? You can actually do it during with this kind of tool, which is, I think, a, a leap forward. Yeah. But I think, you know, um, I think that we are going to see, and we already are, um, I don't know if you saw House of Cards, uh, that, that's definitely, 
I've only watched a couple of episodes. Yeah. Oh, it's also very long in the end, uh, in my opinion. But I think here in the last season, I think us with the second last season, um, there was um, a person, a military uh, person that has post-traumatic stress that actually was trained um, with a headset like this, right? So they, they trained the person to, to try to go back into society without getting anxiety and so on. So I think it's going to be part of the medical system where, you know, we get diagnosed and then you, instead of people have to showing up, uh, it's, it's, you know, the biggest problem is like you, you're afraid of going outside with some of these diseases, right? I mean, so you, you, you don't dare to open the door. I mean, you think you get killed or whatever it is. Uh, and then, you know, here you can get this headset and we can get very close to a real world environment where you actually go outside your own door or into a shopping mall. And then you train the person. Maybe there's only one person they meet in the first session, right? And then they, okay, they get newer to that person, start to talk to them. And then the next time there's going to be five people, you know, and 10 people. And then this way you can retrain yourself back to actually being able to go into society. And uh, so, so that project we are working on is, 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 is already showing some really great project, uh, sorry, progress with this kind of technology. There was a TV clip about it in the, in the Danish TV uh, recently, where this guy, he had never been, or he hadn't been out for a very long time and suddenly he could actually go back out uh, and also come back to therapy, right? That he dares to go out the door, get down to, to the therapist. And I mean, mm -hmm. just that is going to help tremendously, right? And, and I think wow. that's, that's really exciting. That's very powerful. Yeah. And I, I, I really do believe that um, virtual reality and these other types of connect, uh, technologies that help you reconnect with yourself and help you be a better human. And part of that is, I mean, part of us being human is connecting with other people. But sometimes yeah. you get stuck in these loops where, especially with uh, 2020, is mm -hmm. that you, you'd stop connecting with people. And then you'd get this because you stop connecting with people, you get this weird fear and, and it starts to build up. And then you get the mm -hmm. social anxiety and all that fun stuff. But if you can use the technology to retrain people, to have them get more comfortable, I could see that as being a, such, a, such a powerful thing because a lot of times people – have live lives of quiet desperation or in so much pain because they don't know how to communicate. But if you can train them and actually turn that more into a game where they can see their their biofeedback, I could see that as being so so powerful. And yeah. one note on that, I'd love to dive a little bit into. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming you're you're very familiar with the vagus nerve, the parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system, things like that. And you're, you're, it sounds like you're you're taking a lot of things from the eye tracking to everything else and really digitizing that system, and allowing people to be able to see basically the sympathetic nervous system ex digitized outwards. Is that, mm -hmm. is that primarily what you're doing? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you could claim that. I mean, I'm, I'm not myself a neuroscientist, right? And that's, that's maybe why, you know, a guy like me is the guy who put this system together with the team because, you know, I'm not biased. You know, you have psychologists yeah. have one truth. Mm -hmm. Then you have like medical doctors have another truth. And then psychophysiologists, they have a third truth, right? So I think, you know, we have tried to kind of, you know, uh, mm -hmm. take a broad platform make sure that everybody has good data and then they can believe in what they want do you know what I mean but, but um yeah so uh, so yeah I mean there are people who are looking into this also a more deeper neuroscience and so yeah. on uh, and, and even we have some people who have also used fMRI and so on uh, for, for for some of this kind of research right yeah. um, I have another I mean, example though if I can just jump back uh, one second yeah, that I want yeah, to mention, since you are very excited about VI, I just thought about it there uh, sure. So, so the other big area that we are seeing exploding right now is, is training, uh, training and simulation. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine that you have to train somebody uh, going out to, uh, you know, oil drilling platform or something like that, you know, we can, you know, basically uh, create the whole environment where they get trained and, and instructed right away. And one of the wild things that, that some people at MIT has built is that you can actually go into the environment together with uh, the person you're training. So let's say if, 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 if I'm sitting here, I can have the instructor sitting somewhere else in the world and being right in the same environment. So I could stand, for example, on the shooting range right behind the person and see how they do. And then uh, the, the newest thing that can happen is that you can then replay all of that. And then together with the, um, with the person who's being trained and the, and the facilitator or trainer can go back in and replay the whole environment while they talk about what happened. You know, I mean, that's, that's awesome. That's super powerful. And, and uh, that, that I think we're going to see over the next couple of years evolve yeah. immensely. And, and, and I mean, that is, that is really, really exciting. That's the same also just for, for schooling and, and teaching that if you have to learn chemistry, for example, you stand in there with all the different modules, you, you move them around, but you can also stand 
you know, a team of five people doing it together uh, in the school. I mean, it's it, this kind of stuff is going to be huge. I love um, that. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the main thing that we've focused on as a company for years has been multi-user virtual reality. Um, mm -hmm. One, because it's so brutally hard to get yeah. right. Um, mm -hmm. And then two, because it has so many powerful effects once you can get it right like the have an observer observe you in the situations and be able to record that reflect that back mm -hmm. all those things are incredibly critical especially when you have a teacher that can change the environment and they could really control everything versus yeah. just mock role playing or imagine shooting a gun you can actually yeah. get up and do it there's and then you stack on top of that the biofeedback to where you know because sometimes you can take a look at someone and like are you good they're like yeah i got this but their heart's racing They'll, they'll yeah. say one thing, mm -hmm. but if the, if the instructor can look at the biofeedback and see how they're actually performing, you can tell that, okay, and there's, and I'm assuming that you have data points, part of biofeedback that can tell if someone is emotionally um, elevated, let's just say, sure. and mm -hmm. they, they, can, they can go back into it. Are you able, do you have any opinions or thoughts on the whole area of flow and people being in flow and using biofeedback to look at that? Do you know what I'm talking about? That's interesting. You mean like this kind of meditation, like kind of being in that special? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, I mean, we have clients looking into it, uh, but it's not mm -hmm. something that I have uh, a special knowledge mm -hmm. about. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, but I do think that there's definitely feedback you can get from, from, uh, from our kind of technologies, uh, of course, also EEG and so on, but all of it combined. So we do have people that, um, that are re doing all kinds of research within uh, that space as well. But it's not something that, that, you know, like, and that's the thing about us. We provide the platform and then people are doing a lot of different research, yeah. of, you know, some of the cases, but actually people own their own data as well, which is, you know, when you work with all this, this uh, leading edge uh, research, you know, like people are also competing on making scientific papers and so on. So like some of the clients also keep it pretty close, you know, sure. exactly what they do, but, um, but yeah. Sure. I was just, I was curious because I know that there's another area because I mean, there's understand the psychology of the brain. I mean, flow is something sure. that's, um, it's like the perfect uh, version of kind of gaming. It's something that if something is challenging, but not too challenging. And then mm -hmm. there's a thing, I think a terminology called stir, which the way that you know you're in flow is that you feel like that you lose a part of yourself, you mm -hmm. lose time, you lose effort and yeah. you, and you become immersed in the situation. Mm -hmm. And so that, that is the thing. So that's what they call flow. So it's whenever you're yeah. doing something so deep, you completely lose yourself in that moment. And so I was just curious yeah. if they had any bio, biometric feedback. So it sounds like probably do. It's just yeah. close to the yeah, chest. But there you would need some of the systems that uh, uh, look a bit deeper into the brain, I would think, before you can measure that, what, right? You can, you can not- What would you I mean, use for that? Also, sorry? What, what, what biofeedbacks would you I mean? Would you use a EKG? What would, what would be the things that you would look um, at? I, I would use the EEG, right? You know, like brain waves that you put mm -hmm. on the head because then you can look at the brain waves and how they, you know, uh, react uh, during a flow situation. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's probably what I think most people would use for that. You could probably also use a bit of heart rate, you know, like that it stabilizes that, you know, when you are in flow, for example. Um, but, but I mean, that, that would probably be two of the, the things that you would, uh, you would use. There could be also something in the eyes, you know, how much you move the eyes. I mean, you have a lot of subs of movements, uh, saccade movements and stuff like that, that could potentially also be used for, for looking at this kind of um, research. Got it. But again, it's not something that I'm an expert in, and, and, uh, but I know that there's clients that have done it. Maybe I can try to figure that out and send over to you if, if there are some cool papers about that. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be interested. Uh, the, but that said, uh, if I can interrupt, I mean, we do yeah. work with uh, most of the large gaming companies that have mm. a system, but then they do the internal research in the R&D department, right? Uh, of course, also on user experience. So I'm pretty sure that some of those guys are, are working with our platform for, for this kind of thing. I, I'm sure they are. And then in terms of uh, setting up the systems, I mean, how how much friction, what is it, what is, if you could talk me through the actual setup of the, um, the iMotion systems uh, locally, mm -hmm. is there a bunch of wires attached to the person that's attached to the computer? Are mm -hmm. they stream, are they streaming through a Bluetooth device from, they just put on these, um, let's say HRVs and other devices. Do they just <laughs> wear it or is it, does it have to be connected to the computer or how does it, how much friction goes into actually the setup of the, uh, the iMotion setup? 
That, that's, a, that's a very good question. I mean, so I would like to start to talk about what did people do before iMotion? So sure. if you, for example, I came out to Texas A&M that have built one of the largest labs in the world. They had an EG system with one specific software for that with, on one computer. Then they have an high and eye tracking tracker with one other software connected to a different computer. And then, they, you know, they had six different computers trying to do this. And then you had one that showed the stimuli. And the core of what we do is that we are one software platform on one computer that can do both all the presentation of the stimuli, the images, videos, like virtual reality, whatever it is. We expose that and can control the stimuli. You know, timing is really important, this kind of studies. And then you basically have all the signals coming into that one computer. And so uh, to elaborate on the answer, it depends on the sensor. So uh, most uh, eye trackers, they're USB, you, uh, you plug it in and then it pops up. And then, you know, it basically, we, we integrate very deeply with the devices uh, so that everything goes into iMotion. So you don't see any other uh, firmware or other um, softwares that you need to operate. That's the whole key that you only have one interface and then it all pops up with live monitoring of, you can see actually, Am I sitting here? Then my pupils would go like this. So you have this live feedback of the sensors. So most of them are, are USB uh, ports. And then there's also a few um, uh, Bluetooth devices. Um, so, so, I mean, in general, it's, it takes 10, 15 minutes to set up. I probably okay. have to be careful what I say. Maybe there's some clients come <laughs> back and say they used an hour, but, uh, but, but in general, it's, it's relatively average. quick to, uh, to set up. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, there's, there can be a little bit of troubleshooting if, if the Bluetooth doesn't connect, or maybe they didn't have a Bluetooth uh, if they have a desktop. And there can be some small hiccups like that. But in general, it is more or less out of the box. Um, so that's, that's, that's very easy compared yeah. to what you have seen. And I think yeah. when I talk to some of these clients, uh, there's, there's a video on our site when we talk to Texas and m <clears throat> like they used maybe six months to learn to operate the system. So when you had a PhD student that had half a year to conduct some research studies, all they learned was after, you know, that six months was to get the systems to operate and then they never made it out to, to collect data <laughs> and do the research. So, I mean, that's what's really exciting about what we do that you can start from day one, uh, play around with some study design and then go into data collection and really make use the time on what brings value Hence, building new metrics, finding new exciting things about human behavior, and so on. So that is is definitely a leap forward uh, compared to what what has been out there before. I completely agree. Yeah, the uh, being someone who works with high technology, it is so frustrating when you get a new piece of technology. You're incredibly <laughs> excited about it, and yeah. you spend your whole time setting up the environment, and you're just like, I just want to get in to do some work, and you just you it, it. It's so terrible. then. Yeah, yeah, it's a very, it's a very frustrating thing when you're talking about it. It reminds me of all the other technologies. So that's why I generally kind of wait a beat when something new comes out in my world. Like, yeah. okay, let's just give that just a little bit of time for all the all the pioneers to just get the arrows in their backs, and we're gonna get yeah. that going. And I'll come in right behind that and pick up yeah. and run with it. So that's. Great. I think one one of one of the uh, most uh, one of the most often heard senses I have is like, oh my God, Peter, why didn't we hear about you six months ago? Mm -hmm. Because people went out. They talked to a hardware company, then they tried to sell them the most expensive hardware, they fired off the budget, and then this device came and they couldn't use it for anything, right? And, and, and I mean, and, and you know, that's terrible because a lot of researchers, they can then not get the money again, right? They get one yeah. brand and then they have to fire off the money and then boom, you know, and then, you know, they didn't get the right consulting. So a big part of, yeah. of what our company does is this full ecosystem of both low uh, medium and high range sensors. So depending on your research, we will not sell you some hardware that is giving more than what you need, right? So yeah. that we can fit more modalities into it and make sure that there's also money left for hiring somebody to do the research or whatever it is. So, so that is this kind of, you know, consultative selling approach that we have uh, based on the ecosystem of partners that we have built. Um, mm. So, yeah, so that's, that's cool. Hmm? A uh, question for you on the, you were talking about um, MIT um, earlier yeah. doing that, because I, I did a, I did some work over, um, they had a, one of the, I think it was the world's largest hackathon, virtual reality hackathon. So I was over yeah. at the MIT Media Lab, went yeah. over there, helped run it, judge it, taught some Pretty workshops cool. in VR and stuff. So I think we uh, actually sponsored the event. I don't know if you, uh, you saw. Was it, was it uh, uh, virtual reality? Was that the name of it? Or do you um, know what the, 
was it was a hackathon over there with with yeah. VR, and and mm-hmm. we provided some some systems for some you know for some people to create closed loops. Was it Scott Greenwald? Scott Greenwald, perhaps. Yeah. Yep. 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 So Scott yeah. is a good personal friend of mine, and he's actually oh, the guy yeah. who built the other stuff I talked about with training. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yes. Yeah. Scott gave me an epic insider trip uh, tip on where to find some amazing lobster rolls at a, oh, yeah. a, a dive uh, dive bar place, uh, and so. Yeah, he Scott's great. He and he parties, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he was at my 40th birthday here in Denmark. You know, he was oh, really? uh, yeah, going oh. into the, the ocean at five o'clock in the morning. That was uh, that was a good that was a good party. But too many years ago now. I'm 44 yeah. now. But uh, yeah, yeah, that was uh, fun. Uh, he's great, and 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 uh, you know, like we, the MIT story is a longer one. But um, mm. I actually more or less moved over to the states to try to build up emotions out of MIT. But uh, mm. I don't know if you want that story but but that's why i think there's a lot of heroes that walk around that i'm very inspired about i mean yeah. that that whole you know ecosystem uh, for entrepreneurship mm-hmm. over there and you know like just i love that hardcore mathematicians with long hair standing there is is networking around with like the, the top three business school guys in the world right from from sloan i mean that is just a this melting pot of innovation, man, and, and entrepreneurship. And it's just, it's a very unique, unique place in the world, in my opinion. Um, it's very powerful. Yeah. yeah and I that's remember- where emotions came up. I mean, and, and, and it happened because a lot of the sensor companies, biosensor hardware mm-hmm. companies are also based in Boston. So that was also the perfect place for us to, to kind of, um, yeah, start up in the first place where we had to build the product. We didn't know anything. I'd never talked to a university professor before. Yeah. And I moved to the States with nothing. And then it's like, within year one, we want Stanford, MIT, and Harvard as clients. And then if they start publishing, everybody wow. else is going to look at it. And then I came over with, with the, uh, Ole, who has been sitting uh, beside me for 15, 16 years now. And, uh, and it was just crazy. We just started calling all these guys to figure out what, how we should build it, right? And uh, yeah, and, and it's, it happened. See, that's a powerful lesson, though. Looking back at that, you said you just, you just started calling people, seeing how you could add help. I'd love to hear a yeah. little bit more about that, a little bit more about the, because you're just like, oh, yeah, we just got Harvard and Stanford. <laughs> yeah. Some very large, you know, uh, exactly. well respectedly. So how did you, how did you reach out to them? How did you, how did you, how are you of service to them? Like, how yeah. did you figure that out? No, but that's, that's, uh, I mean, I think that's, that's what most entrepreneurs are good at, right? Bashing in the mm-hmm. door. And then, you know, like, um, I remember clearly one time we met with uh, the Lincoln Lab over there, and I can't talk about what they do sure. and so on, but, but um, that's how we actually came up with the idea for the API, because we met with them, and then they said, wow, this is great what you have, but this is what we need. We need to be able to um, uh, shoot some data ourselves into your platform, uh, and then we also need to grab some of the biosensors on the other side, and that's how we came up with this API for the closed loop system. And I, I told the guys, wow, yeah, that's cool. You know, like uh, we can't do that now, but can we come back to you in two months from now? And then I went back to the guys and said, hey, can we do this? Uh, oh, we need to do this. Let's build it, right? And we just have an awesome team of very sharp engineers. And, and you know, they came up with it. I went back, you know, again and again and again. And that's how it happens, right? I mean, like, you know, I probably had like thousand plus dollars smacked into my face. No, you know, yeah. when you can do this, come back and and... That's basically how iMotions is where it is today and why it's so unique. We just kept going, right? And, and you know, there's a lot of people who don't have patience, right? They wait for the hockey stick, you know, the VC thing, and then boom, you know, but but it's so hard to make it there when it's new disruptive technology. I mean, it's, it's you know, when v, v, VCs talk about success for a, for a, a high-tech company, it's like, wow, yeah, five years is the time horizon. But honestly, when there's something uh, that I've seen succeed, we talk 15, 20 years, right? I mean, and it's that it takes a long time to really build something uh, that that is also going to stay in the market, right? Mm-hmm. And all of those clients that you build up, bootstrapped as we have done, you know, they are sticking with you, right? And 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 they really, you know, love to be called and and hear, hey, what's up? You know, what? So so I think that whole, you know, client is king, and I think that's really uh, how we made it happen. That that these guys, they. Even though they they said okay this is never gonna work you're never gonna make it to synchronize this data they still liked it because we kept you know calling and coming back and going out there meeting them and say hey we want to build this for you and so on right and I think that's that whole entrepreneurial you know excitement and passion that you try to get into the client so they're even like well okay 
you know, I don't think it's ever going to happen, but here's $20,000, man. And, you know, you, you're a cool guy, you know, and then you, I get energy from it. Let's, let's go. Right. That's so, so um, yeah. And then it was, yeah. Client by client, one after one. And then when you have one of them, you can, you know, name drop it on the phone. It's like, yeah. So we just have a uh, Harvard and it's funny because as you know, you can hear, I have an accent, Danish accent. Right. So, mm-hmm. and then we have Harvard, Harvard university. Right. So when I called people, it's like, yeah, we have Howard University. And they thought it was Howard, the H-O-W-A-R-D, mm-hmm. Howard University. Howard. Like, yeah, and it's like, that's a funny client you mentioned right there. You know, it was like, Howard, Howard University. So yeah. uh, that was pretty, that's pretty a, funny. Again, the the uh, gap in the actual communication from one person yeah. to another. The yeah. What a, a powerful lesson I do. The, the, the ability to not dash in the door ask them how you could be of service and then run away and go build the thing and then come back yeah. and go, this, this is what you want. I have this for you, but also yeah. being willing to get so many doors slammed in front of your face, that yeah. emotional resilience oh, is yeah. something that it sounds like is absolutely critical to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, what would you, um, let, I'll go back and talk about MIT and Harvard and some things in just a moment here, but I, one thing that just popped in my head, what, do you, what would you consider your superpower to be? Oh, that's a good question. I think I have an extreme energy level, right? I mean, when I, I, I mean, at least when I was younger, right now, it's yeah. it's getting a little bit different when you have 11 months mm. uh, son, you know, that, uh, you know, you have to try to sleep a little bit and so on. But, but I think the energy and, and, you know, the passion I have is, is really like going into other people. And I think that's mm. an important skill that when something doesn't exist, you have to be good at selling air basically, right? Because it's not there, but you have to sell a vision. So, so I think, Visionary sales is, is probably, uh, I don't know if you heard that, uh, or missionary sales. It's like no. you sell something that doesn't exist, but you, 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 you sell a vision and get people to believe it. And that's how it starts, right? And then mm-hmm. when you get somebody to buy into it uh, and is interested or they want to do a trial, then you start the trial, right? And so you keep handholding all of these guys. And, that, and then, you know, it happens, you know, in incremental small steps. And then at some point you have the right product because, if you're smart at listening to what the clients wants and what the needs really are, and you build it, then at some point you have closed that gap between, you know, what they really need and what you thought they needed. Right. And, and I think that's, that's a powerful skill for an entrepreneur to have. Yeah. And then I think resilience, you know, like that you keep going, working day and night, you know, you don't see anything else. I've lived in a silo for like more than 10 years. And it's a bit crazy with regards to that. So, you know, in your family, you have to, I mean, you, you, you know, you want to be there. You want to be a hero for everybody you can and so on. But you also have to disappoint a lot of people, uh, unfortunately, right? I'm a very social guy. My friends are very important to me. But for many years, they know, okay, we don't see Peter. When we invite him, he doesn't answer. And sometimes he shows up, right? But they always know when they look in my face, you know, when I get tears in my eyes, when I see them, you know, like of happiness, you know, they know that I've been on this path for changing the world. And I've been like that since I was a small boy. Uh, wow. So, so, so I think that's, you know, you have to have an extreme drive uh, and mm-hmm. basically be able to, to cut everything out. And when I talk, you know, I invested in, in five or six companies now as well. And as a mentor, I try to help some of the younger entrepreneurs not make the same mistakes that I, I did. And, you know, it's, it's, that is really super important as, as you know, to make sure that you have some mentors around you. Because yeah. when you are an entrepreneurship, there's also a lot of, it also attracts a lot of people who just see fast cash and, oh, I, I want to, you know, get some of this and so on. So I always have the principle of trying to help a lot and show the value before I even ask for something. And then in general, the people, they come back. And if they're good people and, and they can see the value, then they offer you something, right? I think that's the, the right approach to have as a, as a mentor. That's, that's beautiful and wonderful. And, and uh, yeah, that's uh, lessons learned of... Uh, emotional resilience sticking with things resilience and then and then also understanding that it's being a hero or being on a mission is uh is a a situation of sacrifice you can't you can't be an everyday person and be that you can't eat your cake and have it too at the same time as we would say so it, it there has to be some sort of balance and you said that you've been on a mission like this since you were a little boy um what is what is your holy grail for all of this you, you know what do you ultimately want to do with eye emotions what do you ultimately want to try to uh create as a as a company you know i mean it's it's i definitely hope that we can 
built a very like now uh, David is a, a good friend for Unity, uh, mm. one of the founders of Unity. We actually mm. started the same place, iMotions and Unity, when we were oh, both wow. like two, three people 16 years ago. So we know each other pretty well. But I think wow. the, the power that they have in the way that they have helped so many people and 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 changed the lives of so many people, I think that's that's basically a dream. Um, but but I, I think you know um, being able to change the world to a better place with this technology, like for example, helping families, as I talk about, like that has these diseases, you know, there's a lot of people getting sick early, right? With Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, all this. How can we, and we live longer and longer, right? We need to be better at identifying it early and, and really go in and see what we can change. And now understanding a lot about the brain and so on, I think that, that that's going to happen. And I think that's just something that makes me still get out of bed every day and, and still go at it, right? Yeah. But of course, I've, you know, the last, you know, maybe three, three years, there's also been rough times. I've always been like, you know, you know, and, and so as an entrepreneur, you also need to take decisions. Um, in some ways, you can say there's some, even some maybe narcissistic behavior once in a while, but you can be a, a, use it for something good, right? But you really have to be like laser focused and, and you have to cut the rest out, right? But there's also these more dark periods where you, you know, that you can be close to burning out and all that. And that, that's the tough periods, right? Also when the company suddenly scales and there are so many people, like in the early days when you do this power calling, let's build this, boom, 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 you, you, you move. And, you know, it's very easy for the team to maneuver with you if you suddenly take another direction. Because in order to succeed, you need to change direction suddenly. When you hit a wall, you need to get around it, over it, through a hole or whatever. But if you can't do that, boom, go back a little bit, go to the right, and then you continue forward, right? And that kind of behavior is something that a really good entrepreneur has. But when the company grows and you get, you know, more than 50, closer to 100 people, you need to have middle managers, you need to have other people like, uh, you know, leading uh, people, because that's often not what you're best at. I, I lead through my heart, you know, and my passion. But, you know, I also don't have a big patience, right? It's like, hey, come on, we should have done that yesterday. And, and you know, when you work with people, that can become an obstacle for yourself. Uh, and that's why you have to also, as a, as a founder and CEO, you have to think about, you know, how do you step back? How do you make sure you don't become an obstacle for the, for the vision and the growth yeah. of your own company, right? It's, yeah. it's a very, that's a, something we can talk about for hours, but it's, it's really... <laughs> That is still well, like a, can be a very big struggle, I think. Um, what it, what it sounds to me is that you know, as any um, hero on a hero's journey, that there's there's these evolutions where they they feel like they're going to die and then they're reborn as someone else, right? They need to let yeah. go of who they are for who they're going to become. Yeah. And it sounds like as a company, it's the same type of situation. Is that at, at a younger stage, the company had one identity, but as it grows yeah. to 50 or 100 people, it has mm -hmm. to let go of certain patterns to embrace new ones because that's what's needed at that yeah. phase mm -hmm. of the business, that it has to ad adapt that new that new archetype. Yeah. Um, and, and, then, and, and also, it's it's a special kind of people who works with, with an entrepreneur, like a crazy entrepreneur that just yeah. wants to, like, you follow them, right? So. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a different kind of people that get excited by that and like, woo, and get fired up. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the bigger it gets, you know, those kind of people also have more struggle finding the right roles in the company because there's people who come in with more experience, perhaps, right, in, in, in marketing or whatever it is, the field they're working in. Uh, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting, um, you know, um, what can you call living uh creature such a company that's that's a lot of uh, stuff we can talk about with that but uh, awesome. but anyway we are still here and and, and things are going pretty well uh, so so it's it's good but it's definitely something you as a where you want to be a hero sometimes you don't probably seem like a hero and that that's the tough days because of course you want to inspire people and, and help people and and you know else people will never follow you if they think you have a a bad heart and and if yes. you're driven by money only yeah. that's also like you know i mean you know if, if you're an entrepreneur let's go ah, let's go out and make money i don't believe a company like this would be there because you work with extremely bright people you know like hardcore neuroscientists you know professors that we hire in like have a lot of phds and staff right and and, and you know they want to be here because we change the world they don't want to like you know the, yeah. the money side of things is not necessarily why they're here right so i think that's important it, it's it's needed as a it's needed to survive but it's nothing that will fill up your heart and there's nothing that will keep you around and so exactly. 
hundred percent. Yeah. And yeah, uh, on the note, just to let you know, the, uh, my friends that, uh, put together, um, uh, the MIT hackathon, they're yeah. actually doing it. They're actually doing another one in June over in Boston, uh, for medical mm -hmm. VR. So, yeah. So yeah, I think I'll, I heard about that. We will probably uh, be there. I think, yeah. Um, yeah, because also because it's nice for people to be able to uh, maybe you know we donate the platform so mm -hmm. people they can use that for the hackathon right with the API and the and the eye tracking so they also have the yeah. biometric sensors included. Yeah, um, that'd that's be cool. that's great. Yeah, anytime you can get them together to to do things at this um, hackathon, sometimes magic happens. You know, a lot of times it doesn't turn into anything, but every every once in a while there's projects that come out that 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 yeah. roll on and bring on a life themselves, and yeah. and then they can ideally be able to grow one of these giant companies yeah. and then figure out their place in the world. Um, so we, we had a couple of people from our team that also participated and we had one military government kind of contract where they called mm -hmm. in a lot of companies and then there was kind of a hackathon where we had to um, solve a very complex problem with synchronization of, and that was obviously very easy for us to solve the problem, but you know, it's, it's uh, because of the platform, but that was cool, you know, and, and our team loves this kind of stuff. And talking about hero, I want to make sure that, you know, I'm not the hero, it's the team, it's the people in iMosis that are the, the daily heroes, right? It's amazing, you know, the feeling of, of having so many great people on board. It's, 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 I don't take that for granted for sure. It's tough, especially in COVID times, right? Where, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a tough world and it's hard to be a leader that can be visible, you know, and, and, you know, so it's, it's, you, you had to kind of reinvent that whole, you know, how you do that. Yeah, connecting with the team is super important. And and to touch on that, yeah, I mean, what I look at it as, it's like a justice league of people coming together, right? They're all heroic in their own ways, but at the same time, everyone's got their own kryptonite or thing that stops them. And so you try to help each other out yeah. um, to, to raise everyone up together, but you definitely can't, couldn't imagine being a, a solo person trying to trying to accomplish. You can't change the world if you're only pushing by yourself. I mean, and you, you, need, you need people, you need, because I really think that we become, much more super powered when we all work together. So I 100% agree with you on all of that. Um, I know we're getting toward the, the, the top of the hour here. So I, I'd like to say, is there, is there any last things you'd like to share? Um, anything that you're working on, anything you're excited about um, before I ask how people can get a hold of you? Um, I think we covered a, a lot of the things, but, but you know, coming back to that thing about how do you change the world, I think what is really cool right now is that we are a platform that is lying with all these professors. So all the new innovations that is happening inside the companies and inside the universities, they are being built with our platform, right? I mean, yeah. and we don't necessarily have access to it, but it's just something that, you know, uh, makes us like, super excited every day, right? Um, but I think we we covered most of the things um, uh, today, I, I, I think. Yeah. yeah, love it. Yeah, I, I, I'm imagining it's like the, uh, your company is almost like, and I'm, I'm going to butcher this, but it's like, it's like the emotional engine of change. Like you can, yeah. it, it's the engine that supplies the vehicle to get to where it needs to go. So yeah. that's, that, that that's sounds super. cool. We might, uh, <laughs> we might steal that quote. Yeah. From you. Steal it, take it. It, it, yeah. is, it is donated to you, sir. But it's, it's very yeah. cool what you do. Um, if people wanted to get a hold of you or find out more about your company and what you do, um, how would yeah. they get a hold of you? Um, well, I mean, my LinkedIn profile uh, is, is, uh, is a good place. Uh, if you sure. go to Peter Hartsbeck, um, my email is also peter at imotions.com. So with an S, imotions with an S. So that's send me an email and I would gladly uh, chat. And, and, you know, also I do try to see if I can find some time helping young entrepreneurs, you know, and, uh, you know, that's, that's just really exciting. And, and also you can pick it back a little bit of the young people's energy, right? Uh, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's great. But, but actually what I've, I have maybe one thing that I, I wanted to talk about today as well. I mean, just, sure. and, and, and that is, you know, I've had this company for 15 years and that was my baby. And I finally, you know, uh, became a father this year. And, and, you know, I think, you know, what I figured out is the true heroes mm -hmm. are really parents, you know, I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's insane. And, and I think the biggest task we have in life is, you know, now you're getting a year, like one to two years. So there you're seen as a hero. But I think the biggest quest we all have as parents is to still have your kids see you as a hero when they turn 18 or 20 years old, right? I mean, then you have done something. Uh, if your kids are still looking up to what you have achieved, I think that's, that's, 
an ambition that we should all have as as parents, you know, uh, and staying uh, heroes to the kids. And that's a tough one, right? I mean, especially in the world where everybody has access to all information. You say something, you know, and they go to Google even when they're five years old or, or seven years old. And say, ah, is that true, Dad? You know, <laughs> so it's it's a tough challenge in today's world, I think. But that is wow. meeting true heroes. That's a hundred percent. It's you don't realize it, but you're you're literally raising the next generation. And one of the things I always think about is that, you know, what is a hero and what is a, a villain? A hero is someone who is of service to people, while a villain has power and does things for themselves. And yeah. the, I think the one of the greatest things that the greatest evils is the is is the theft of innocence, robbing a child of their innocence or of their potential. Right. Yeah. And so the exact opposite for a hero yeah. is is inspiring a kid to reach their potential and, and cultivating their innocence and allowing mm -hmm. them to kind of um, flourish in their own time. So yeah. I understand agree. It's a hard task, guys. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a dad, but I, I spent a, a month with my brother and, and um, my niece and nephew that are six and yeah. eight. And I was just like, I cannot believe how much energy they are. I love them, and, yeah. but they also drive me insane. And I'm like, yeah. I have so much respect. Yeah. Um, at the at the same time, I'm like yeah. I'm like maybe I'm gonna wait on this just a little bit longer. Yeah. But uh, yeah. no. well, I really enjoy to be an uncle first. You know, like I have a nephew yeah. that I love really much. Mm -hmm. I see as my own son as well. I mean, like, and he's nine, right? It's it's mm -hmm. amazing. I lived in the states, so it was close. But you know, it's it, oh sorry, it was far away, right? But you know, whenever I was home, it was nice to to always be very close to him, and we stayed close. That's that's a good way to start, you know. Yeah. But it's also good to be able to go home and uh, you know do a podcast. Or like that without the uh, sleep uh, yeah. <laughs> so much respect yeah you could i could tell a new dad that they just got these black bags yeah. around their eyes the yeah. whole time i'm like oh welcome, welcome <laughs> it's you know like you also and that's thing where i must admit this year mm. it has changed the way that i had to work because i always could focus like now i need time i just did it during the night or whatever and now it's it's not possible anymore so when you have to be creative i just today i sat writing a, a long email to our team about 2020 reflection uh 2021 uh you know prediction or like what do i think is going to happen and it's taken me honestly man i don't hope they see this in that way but but it took me a week to get to where it's i think it's where I feel that the energy comes out of my writing, right? And it's it's mm. tough to find that energy somehow, uh, at least the first year when you have a kid, I think. I don't know if it's the yeah, same yeah. in year two, but I'll figure that out uh, in 2021. <laughs> it's it's, it's funneling into them, man. All the energy is just going from you yeah. to them. You're just, yeah. it's the new generation, yes. man. That's, yeah. It's so powerful, man. Well, I honor you for doing that, brother. That's, that's so incredible. Um, Peter, thank you so much for your time, man. This has been wonderful. Um, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to make this happen and uh, and overall, you know, building an incredible company to help a bunch of other uh, people on their path. Uh, I think it's super cool what you do and and I appreciate it. Well, thank you to you and I'm really happy you want to uh, to chat with me today and I look forward to, to meet you in California when we can start traveling again. I'm definitely going to be there, so I'll, I'll look you yeah. up and uh, make sure we can grab a beer or, or hang 100%. out. 100%. Yeah, yeah, that'd be super fun. I'd love to get yeah. together with you. Uh, maybe yeah. we'll grab Skip along the way, but uh, that, that would be great. So yeah. thank you so much yeah, for your that time. Yeah, that would be fun. And uh, <laughs> make sure, you know, if you come to Denmark, uh, you're also very welcome, or, or Boston, where we also have a quite big office. So you yeah. might be there. Yeah. That, that, that might be a good one, too. That'd be awesome. Cool. <laughs> All right, okay. Peter, have a great day, man. Thank I'll talk much. to you later. Yeah, yeah. see you. Bye-bye. Bye now.